usually takes a second, but hey everyone, this is Faye from Face World Media. I'm here with a lovely Eden Liu from Camel. And uh, Eden is the customer relationship. You know, I, I see you as a brand ambassador, basically. And, basically. you know, you're on the Camel <laughs> channel. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who don't know what Camel is, I actually purposely didn't set it up on my end so you can see the big difference uh, between kind of my video just right through Logitech versus Eden's. And that is fully controlled. And Eden's going to really demonstrate a lot of the features. So I think if you guys are anybody watching here today, author, entrepreneur, creator, uh, and frankly, also like if you're running webinars, uh, you're moderating yes. large sessions, you know, Zoom webinar or like fancy hop in, who below, whatever it may be, uh, definitely this is the session for you. And Eden's going to demonstrate some new features as well. So we got people hopping in already, and this is fantastic. We're doing a pair streaming between Face World and Camel. And really appreciate that you are here today. Please leave us any questions. And, and Eden, feel free to, uh, you know, moderate with me, whatever questions you want to ask your audience as well. Cool. Thank you so much for having me, Faye. I'm really excited to come on your show. You just came on my show not too long ago, even though the episode hasn't been released yet, but it's on the way. The game plan is being ironed out as we speak. Um, but yeah, as Faye said, Camo is a great tool for anyone that is on video. That's whether you're live streaming, whether you're just doing a lot of videos, calls on Zoom, or whether it's like just you know, if you're creating content, we, you know, camo isn't just for streaming. It's not just for video calls. It also can record video. So it's basically anything content video related. Camo is here to facilitate that. Like we have so many, I have so many like cool ways to like suggest for people to use camo, even if they have awesome setups. Um, so I will let Faye lead the conversation, but I'm just so excited to be here with Faye today. Oh, we're, you know, if I could be in New York right now, we're probably, you know, grabbing tea, coffee somewhere and, and be chatting about how to leverage guys, you know, your phone to be this ultimate webcam. I wish I knew this. I mean, I think a lot of people wish they knew, especially, you know, going into the, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, because you remember, uh, Eden, how rare it, it was, how difficult it was to find a webcam anywhere. Yes. They were sold out entirely in 2022, in March, April, you could not find a webcam for like at least three months. And I, that is actually sort of Camo's origin story was during the pandemic when webcams were about as scarce as water in a video game or something. <laughs> um, and our guys came up with the idea, like, you know, we have these awesome, amazing cameras in our pockets. Everyone has a really amazing camera on their phone, whether it's iPhone or Android. Like these people at Apple, at Samsung, they put so much R&D into that camera and being able to create, shoot beautiful photos and shoot amazing video using your phone. So it was like, the idea was just like, why can't we use it as a webcam? Like, wh why are we limited to only shooting on our phone? And mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm not a developer, but our genius team <laughs> development team you know made it happen and that is camo's origin story is we wanted to facilitate better video for everyone it's fantastic and a camel's origin story is something i have to thank my producer uh herman once again uh who's actually one of the paintings for those of you uh, oh nice in the background uh and uh herman literally recommended camel to say you gotta check this out because um as a world both live streamers and to be able to control you know, the orientation to use the front and the back of your phone. And one situation situation that I ran into was um, I'm also a moderator for these virtual events as a strategist, um, trainer, moderator. Uh, my, you know, I love everything from Elgato, but the green screen's width is literally this much. It was just not wide That's enough. Right. Yeah. Or, right, my Zoom window, like it's not like green, traditional green screens are not designed to be 16.9. And I ran into this issue last minute and Camel was such a savior uh, for me to uh, basically be able to zoom in and out through a simple control uh, to facilitate that session in front of 5,000 people. So that was fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was kind of going to ask, I was like, if this was already into your sort of webinar training and, and Zoom training, because you are such like a Zoom whiz. I've watched your YouTube videos and I still, sometimes when it comes to being in Zoom, I'm like, oh, if they did that really cool thing, do I wanna try it in this meeting? But <laughs> um, no, I totally know what you mean. It's, um, it's a great tool, especially for Zoom. That's actually our 
like starting out, we that was our like marketing push was to help you elevate your Zoom calls. And just you, just like you said, that Zoom mm -hmm. and pan feature mm -hmm. that we have is so useful. I joke that because I eat lunch in my office, I leave like a half a sandwich behind me sometimes and I don't realize that I don't have it cropped out. But <laughs> using camo, I can just like slide that Zoom bar in a little bit and pan up so that you don't see my leftover lunch in a meeting. <laughs> exactly. And and it's like it's so subtle yet something about uh, I have this kind of admiration towards like British design and software company and camels. One of them, it just works. And, you know, we're I'm first of all, we are not I'm not paid to even say this, but the user interface is so intuitive. And maybe Eden, at one point, something you can demonstrate. Do you think we should do that now or a little later? Sure. Yeah, okay. we can go ahead and do a little demoing now. OK, look at how good Eden looks with our background and um, how smooth the transitions are. Yeah, but so this is the camo mm -hmm. interface. You can hide these as, as needed so you can see more of yourself or if you need to see more of your adjustments. We have people that don't know that you can actually hide these then only need like one feature and they're like, how do you get it mm -hmm. to go away? But basically we have all of these settings on the right hand side that are your basic camera lighting and image adjustments. You have your white balance. You can shift it to be warmer or cooler. I like to be right in the middle a little bit. Um, brightness, saturation, contrast. I have it set perfectly so that it makes my hair look really shiny and also really dark and black. So you can really fine tune your image to make it look exactly how you want. That's the video superpower that we say is camo. Um, but it's not just the adjustments, the zoom and pan also super useful tool. Like I said, if, if I happen to leave some of my lunch in the background, I could just easily zoom and pan so you can't see it, but mm -hmm. I have my setup framed perfectly today. <laughs> well, look at that. I didn't know there's a little touchpad thing, the gray bar in the lower left-hand corner. I had no idea you can actually reposition the framing of yeah. your video. Oh, I did not know this. No, it's. That's also, I will say, we are not, we don't have a huge video library showcasing all of the ways to maximize camo, which is something we are working on. We can do a lot better at presenting these features to you guys. So that is on our to-do list. But um, in the meantime, that's why I make appearances like this. So I can sort of like walk people through all of the coolest like features of camo. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll just go ahead and walk through a few of the other features. Um, sure. That's cool. Yeah, just absolutely. Like, yeah. So like Faye said earlier, you can use all the lenses on your phone. Um, I go selfie lens. I have mine pointing towards a BTS <laughs> photo card. Um, I love like going ultra wide to be able to show off more of my setup. Wow. If it was cleaner, obviously. But telephoto also, it's going to get really up close and personal. But, you know, this could be useful if you had like a dermatologist appointment. They can see every single pore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that gives you a lot of versatility in your, in your different camera angles. You can show as much or as little of your setup as you want. Camo is also really great as a secondary shot. I love to say for people that do have the professional DSLR mirrorless setups, um, if you have a top-down shot, a a little iPhone is much easier to mount than a full camera setup. Um, and yeah, you have all these resolution options. Of course, we want to keep it at 1080 because we like to look nice and sharp here in camo. Mm -hmm. um, and also one of my favorite undersold features, which really plays towards your sort of like Zoom webinar um, mm -hmm. audience is our overlays. So we created this overlay gallery that we have like sort of built in um, built in overlays for you to use, but you can also import your own. And my favorite thing about that is that you can set up keyboard shortcuts to switch between them easily. So like I just imported these in here today. Like I'm not using anything else other than keyboard shortcuts to mm -hmm. run this sort of mini slideshow, which I think is just one of our most undersold, really, really cool, really useful features if you're in a meeting um, mm. and want to like, you know, stunt for the bosses a little bit and be like, look, I have actually like slides and you didn't want to do a full PowerPoint or keynote. You can just use camo, switch between them mm. using keyboard shortcuts. And yeah, that's sort of the just rundown of most of the general camo features. 
Um, but if there's any specific use cases that anyone wants to know about, feel free to ask and I'm happy to elaborate. Awesome. I love the demo. Thank you so much, Eden. And for anybody uh, who's watching right now or later, feel free to leave us comments. I do monitor my comments on YouTube. And uh, yeah, Eden, show me one more time how you uh, place the overlay again. Uh, which button was that? Sure. So the overlays are mm -hmm. in the left control panel right near yeah. the middle. Um, if you open up the gallery, it sort of gives you a preview of what each one is going to look like. So mm -hmm. as you guys can see, I have... Um, Wait, can you guys see the overlay window right now? Uh, overlay window, I, I can't. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, it's supposed to have a pop-up window with an overlay gallery that I'm looking at in camo, but I guess something with the screen share isn't letting me show it. Um, I see. You might yeah. have to do a, like an add source thing uh, towards the bottom. And, Let's you know, see. so you can do a screen share. You can do an add source to drop a new window there if you want to. Um, but... Sorry. Oh, that's okay. No worries. <laughs> there we go. This is the overlay gallery Ooh. and what it looks like. So these, I you just favorite them and it'll assign a, short, a keyboard shortcut number to them. And that's how you can switch between them using keyboard shortcuts. It's control um, like one, two, three, four, and five is what I have mine set up to be because it's easy that way. Wow. Very cool. So I know that like I remember being able to use Camo for free for a long time. Could we talk a bit about pricing? And pricing is kind of hard to find on a Camo site, which I love, by the way. So oh, tell us sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So we have a few different pricing options. Um, the So I'll talk about the free version, first of all. The free sure. version actually is already enough to give people a pretty big upgrade in camera quality. It mm -hmm. only lets you go up to 720p, but if you are using like Zoom a lot of the time, Zoom compresses your quality anyway. Mm -hmm. So even just using your iPhone camera at 720, you'll see a major upgrade between the built-in webcam versus using your iPhone. Um, so that is free. The free version also comes with all of our AR modes, which I will just like switch between a few. Um, we have, we partnered with Snap last year to create these nice sort of, um, you know, what? different lenses. You can, you know, I think this is like really good for like raising your hand in Zoom. Um, we have like a invisible filter, which if you don't want to be on screen during your Zoom oh call. My God. <laughs> well, how did you turn those on? <laughs> it's it's just in the modes like and these are all available in the free version um yeah all of the, like we really oh. had kind of fun with these <laughs> oh i that's amazing i can't believe i haven't explored yeah. these yet i'm a big fan of this one it's nice and subtle but you know yeah it's still, it's still pretty cool but um yeah so all of these are available in the free version um, um with for camo take off the watermark also in the free version which a lot of people don't know it's just i think people don't know that you have to try to take off the watermark they just assume you can't but yeah mm -hmm. in the free version you're actually you're just able to take off the watermark we wanted it to be widely usable even mm -hmm. for free so that's the free version and then the pro version gives you all of the cool features that you just saw um and we have a monthly subscription option which is 4.99 a month yearly for $39.90 a month or a lifetime subscription for $79.99 a month. So that's our pricing options. And if you think about it, a webcam is going to cost you at least one, a good webcam is going to cost you at least 150 to 200. So mm -hmm. $80 is you can unlock the power of your webcam, get all the cool adjustments and also get all of the new features we add without any additional cost for life. Whoa. Uh, that's amazing. All right, we got a first question. I'm hearing iPhone a lot. Is Campbell compatible with other Android devices? Yes. So we are compatible with Android. This is, we just sort of put our Android into a public open beta last fall. I will be perfectly honest with you guys. We're not, we don't have as many features for Android as we do with iPhone. Like we don't have the AR modes yet. We don't have portrait mode yet, but like it is, available and it is for free right now on the Google Play Store while it's in beta. So please go check it out. It's it's free to try for Android users. So I my best recommendation is to just give it a try. And I actually have one of my friends, um, Ella Glasgow of Beyond Virtual Events. She prefers using her Android camera because she likes the way the Pixel um, color palette looks compared to the iPhone. And she's used both and she's like 
sorry, I know you guys are iPhone, team iPhone, but I like the Android better. And I'm like, you know, whatever works. Different people have different preferences. And that's why we wanted to expand to Android and Windows is so more people can unlock the power of their smartphone cameras. Yeah, I love that. And uh, it's true. Sometimes people say the same thing about like OBS. Windows version has all these um, gadgets and features and bells and whistles and the Mac version is very minimum, which I like so much better because I, yeah. I just need three things. Like don't distract <laughs> right, right. me with anything else. Um, yeah, so I would love to explore. It's so funny, like we, by the way, I'm you know, obviously very interested in talking to you about your origin stories. And, um, but before we go there just yet, um, you're clear, you know, you're a young person living in New York and you're, you know, the face to a brand and there's just so much excitement to that. And I think your career probably can be very compelling to some of the other people, like I think in their 20s, in their early 30s. And, uh, and beyond, I gotta say, I'm <laughs> envious of that myself. Um, but uh, just curious, like uh, in your tenure at uh, Camel, what have you seen as like the primary audience, like people who are really crazy about Camel? Like I assume creators, like podcasters, live streamers, gamers. Uh, what have you seen so far as trends? Of your yeah, audience? so it, that's it's actually been really interesting. So I started at Camo. Um, last summer. So mm -hmm. it's been we're coming up on my one year anniversary in like a couple of months. So in in the beginning, I will say I feel like mostly it was a lot of people that were using it for zoom calls, a lot of people um, teaching over zoom, I will mm -hmm. say teachers was one of the user bases that I that first really stood out to me. And when I say teachers, I mean, everything from teachers that do art to yoga teachers to math teachers to science teachers, just mm. your everyday elementary school classroom teachers to college professors to, like I said, these sort of niche art, yoga, fitness, um, fitness teachers. That is like a huge mm. part of our user base, which if you think about it, like with the timing of the pandemic, when things basically all had to go virtual, it makes sense because that's when everything had to shift to online instead of in person. And those are mm. the people that sort of didn't really have a choice when it comes to continuing their career. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, a lot of teachers, but recently we've been seeing a lot more like people that do content creation, live streaming, um, live streaming and video content because we are an app that facilitates creating video. Um, so yeah, it's been really interesting to see the shift. And as our user base kind of shift, like so, so do like our features that mm -hmm. we sort of plan for. So it's been really cool to see it happen from the inside instead of being like looking at a product from the consumer point of view. So Yeah, for sure. And that that's kind of fascinating because I think a lot of people who are in touch with me because of Face World Media also happen to be creative entrepreneurs. And I know that's a pretty broad spectrum of people, podcasters, YouTubers, writers, and solopreneurs. And how do you envision uh, people who are, I guess, kind of new to this or have some doubts, questions of like, oh, what if this breaks or, um, you know, like I think some people are thinking about I have so much to focus on for Zoom. And what would you say to that crowd to kind of try Camel for the first time? What are some of the best practice and kind of dip their toes in and just to see whether this is right for them or not? Well, first, I'd like to say we do have that monthly option for people that aren't sure if they want to commit. And it's five dollars a month to try. And, you know, we have a 30 day money back guarantee. So even if you spent the five dollars and you weren't happy with Camo, we mm -hmm. are will be happy to process that refund for you because we want everyone to be happy with the product. Mm -hmm. But for people that aren't sure if this is, you know, a road that they want to go down. I really honestly because it's i fell into content creation in my podcasting which i'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit and it, it is like the nike logo just do it like <laughs> i am i grew up i played sports i know you did too so it's like i'm a big like sports mentality kind of person mm -hmm. and i know it's super cliche but honestly it's just do it get in front of the camera even if you are God, it was Doc Rock that's been saying this recently. He's he's saying just get in front of the camera, even if it's your phone selfie cam, and just like record yourself saying a few sentences about how your day went to get used to seeing yourself and listening to yourself on video. You do get used to it. Everyone hates the sound of their voice. 
Mm -hmm. but you don't have to get hung up on that. You can get used to your voice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always thought I had like the most awkward sounding voice. It's not very girly, but it's not, not girly either. It's like this very, like, you know how like some girls have this really cute tone to their voice. That isn't me. Like, that's just not what I sound like. And I was yeah. really self-conscious about that because I'm, I don't know why, because people are self-conscious about their voices also because, you know, I think the voice that we hear when we talk is different than when we hear a recorded version of our our same vocals but mm -hmm. i'm i'm really lucky to have a my podcast producer that really was just like dude i love your voice like you mm -hmm. need to stop overthinking it just here are some sentences please read them for me so i can use them for a voiceover and so i i just fell into it i got used to listening to the sound of my own voice and now i love it and mm -hmm. i wasn't always comfortable on camera to begin with but mm -hmm after a few live podcast performances and when the podcast went virtual because of the pandemic also, we had to cancel one of our big live events. We went virtual for it and I just, you just get used to it. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm going with the Nike, just do it. You're not gonna be great your first two, three, four, maybe 10 takes, mm -hmm. but like you will get better at it. It's all about reps. And I'm that might be, like I said, a little jock sort of cliche, but it's it's true. And like, honestly, every every creator that I've spoken to has kind of echoed that. It's it's all about reps. Mm, I, I actually really like the message that you're sending out here because whenever we post something in, I think there's like the Asian hustle network or like creator network or podcast movement, whenever you public, we share like, what are something that you're struggling with? And I always expect people to say something specific, like technical or something they're struggling with, uh, it's always ends up to be like, I don't know how to start, where to start, what if my ideas don't work and what I don't like my voice, don't like the way I look on camera, all these things. And then I think this is where when you find the right coach and the right, uh, you know, someone like a strategist or consultant can really push you through because I know I've done that a lot for my clients. Yeah. And once you are, yeah, it's absolutely true. Once you get over that hurdle that you just you know, you actually are not afraid anymore. And um, also like once you've done it once or twice, you get addicted, you started to really enjoy them, the totally. creation process. Um, I love the transition by the way. And for people, by the way, thinking about like our background, I want to show you like, we literally right now, it is just Eden and me. And we just have, you know, I'm just like clicking on these things and looks kind of magical. This is all They're fun. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun. And we're, it's just us. We don't need a co-host. Uh, we don't need some fancy team to be supporting us. And, and yes, of course I could add all these things, add all these people, but I just chose not to like that. I don't want anything to come in the way as an excuse to not be able to do this. It's too expensive. That person's not available. I don't want to learn this myself, like remove the excuses and enjoy the process. Uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, Eden, let me ask you, let's talk about your podcast. First of all, you mentioned it, it went viral, interesting life events. Like what, what, tell us about your podcast. Sure. So I used to basically be on a basketball podcast. It was called the athletic MBA show. Um, actually previously before that it was used to be on ESPN is the true hoop podcast. And then it was the basketball analogy. I came on at the very end tail end of that. And then we moved to the athletic. So basically the podcast was sports. I, the show was called the NBA Daily Ding, which is still running right now. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not on it anymore because it requires a little bit more time and effort to still be able to do. But like it's, I come from a sports background and it's basketball, basketball stats, basketball mm -hmm. analysis, and also lifestyle and how sort of basketball was like sort of the, um, the glue that held the group of people together for the lifestyle podcast is like, that was like our common interest, but we'd also like take listener questions and um, just talk about culture and, mm -hmm. and, and life and how kind of it, how sports kind of plays into it for all of us. Um, I will say it was a experience that I totally fell into and the podcast shows. So like, just for example, me coming on Faye's podcast, and when Faye came on my show, I we were sending each other topics that we were going to cover mm -hmm. at least. And, you know, general rundown, what are we going to talk about, mm -hmm. et cetera. There was none of that for this basketball show. It was very like, hey, we're just going to get five or six of you guys on a call together. And, you know, the conversation will run itself. Super and organic. so, yeah. yeah, I really learned sort of like things like timing and, you know, listening to be able to pick up like 
pick up other points from what people were saying. Like I really learned it all on the fly. I came from a events background. Like I produced events in New Orleans for 10 years and fell into podcasting and ended mm -hmm. up doing that for five years. I still love it. Like I still do um, the Friday mailbag show with my old podcast crew just because it's um it's like a fun show that I don't have to do very much prep for. It's called the mailbag. So we just kind of take listener questions. Um, but I just learned so much from that experience. And there's a lot to be said about being very prepared. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes through the experiences where the people that you're working with aren't that organized, you can also learn a lot about oh, both like yourself and about like the podcasting process. So counterintuitive. I think we need to break down <laughs> some of the things because I think whenever we're in an organizational situation or our or, or creative endeavor, we do want to line up certainly. We want to feel ready, but ultimately you're right. And sometimes the more spontaneous conversations are more compelling. And sometimes even no matter how prepared and how good of a job you've done, it might still not go, you know, might not go sideways, but it might still disappoint you in some ways. So you, you said something like two minutes ago, I think, uh, of p basically picking, paying attention, listening and picking out uh, keywords or, or things Talking like nuggets that could be people. interesting. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you do that for a live show versus like an interview like this? You know, I honestly active listening, like mm -hmm. a lot of the times I feel like people come on podcasts or interviews and they have points that they are ready to give. They have takes. They're ready to shoot off all of these points, all of these stats, all of mm -hmm. these, mm -hmm. you know, very poignant points. And call to actions. <laughs> yeah. Call to actions. <laughs> they're all ready to go. But I think what makes for a really good podcast conversation or just in-person conversation, whether it's being recorded or not, is really, really paying attention to what the other person is saying and responding to that instead of like, I know it's actually sort of a flaw of mine as a podcast host sometimes is I can get caught up in wanting to mm -hmm. stick to the rundown. But mm -hmm. something that I've been trying to let go of is not sticking to the rundown and Whatever my guest says, I mm. will really make try to make it a point to keep that talking point going because it feels more organic. It's not as planned. Mm -hmm. It's not scripted. And I think that comes through in mm -hmm. like from the viewer's point of view. It's like it doesn't feel like it's just one person asking question and another person answering them. It feels yeah. like a free flowing conversation. And that's more relatable because that, those are the conversations we have in real life. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, like just now you mentioned New Orleans and you were an event planner organizer there for, uh, organizer for 10 years. Is that where you grew up or could you tell us maybe about your origin stories? Sure. So I actually grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was born in North Carolina, Duke Hospital. So I'm a big Duke fan. Um, but I moved to Arkansas when I was two because my dad got a job at the med school there. Super cliche Asian thing, I know, right? Dad got a job at the med school, so we moved somewhere in the Midwest. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, very um, immigrant parents, not around a lot of Asians at all. Um, so now living in New York, it's actually like sort of a culture shock because I have like mm. so many more cultures around me. But yeah, so I grew up in Arkansas and then I went to school in New Orleans and then just stayed there for a decade after graduating. Um, yeah, a lot of events in New Orleans, a lot of fun. It's a great city for your 20s, but at some point it was time to sort of grow out of that phase of my life. Oh my God, I feel so embarrassed. I just assume you're like 24, 25, and I realize as you're describing it, I'm a little bit off. Um, <laughs> I wish I was 24, 25. <laughs> Oh my goodness, how could I be so wrong about this? Um, but I was like, why don't you talk about your career to other people in their mid-20s? Um, so yeah, I should probably double check it. That's, that's a definitely a good thing, uh, for sure. But how do you, I was wondering, like how you're able to kind of pivot your careers? Because, you know, I, I know that every job has many dimensions and many responsibilities, but from the outside, we can see you as basically a YouTuber. You're on Camel's website, like I mentioned earlier. It just I love how streamlined it is. You get the points through. Frankly, it's like an example I've been using for like a new product I'm developing. And it's like, oh, that's so clear. I love the workflow of it. Um, I have another yeah. friend who designed this uh, video editing tool called Recut. Yeah, so that's again, the one I was watching earlier today. <laughs> oh my God, it's Get Recut. Same, very yeah. similar approach. Like guys, if you're developing, thinking about products or courses or uh, whatever software in general, 
definitely check out uh, Camel's website for sure. Um, but yeah, you're doing, you're on the website, you're creating videos, you're doing this with me. And do you think this career is designable? I mean, if people want to do something like this, what's the best approach? I don't know. Like, is there an answer to that? <laughs> My answer would be if, if you want, so just like they said, I, I fall into this sort of purgatory between content creator and working for a, a brand because to be honest, my job is to create content to represent a brand. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different than me going rogue if I wanted to create content myself. But <laughs> I will say there's less there's less financial pressure. So it's I really enjoy doing this for Camo because I get to bring in all of my random crazy ideas to Camo and to see if this is something that we want to explore for our content. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, like, knowing that I have a team to sort of to cater that content to helps me drive the creative process a little bit. So mm -hmm. I will say, though, a lot of my ideas and the work that I do is very heavily influenced by my past experiences doing podcasting, sports podcasting more specifically, because it is very, um, like, I got comfortable doing live streaming and more on the fly, less prepared things mm -hmm. from covering basketball games. We, for the NBA Daily Ding, we would watch a whole nights of basketball. We'd have 15 minutes from the time the last game ended to prep for the show. Mm -hmm. So it was very much like, you know, just taking notes as I go and then come up with cohesive talking points without really that much prep time. So mm -hmm. I really attribute all of my podcasting experience to get me to where I am today. So I would say if someone is looking for sort of to work for a company and get to create content for them, do content on the side, if, even if you, with the job that you have now, because creating content, like there's no excuse. There's so many tools out there, camo, all of these other tools that you can use that are low cost and easy and intuitive to use like get on youtube tutorials if you don't know how to use obs or ecamm like mm -hmm. there's all these resources out there like even if it's not your job right now start mm -hmm. to build up a content library like mm -hmm. i i got hired at this job because of my podcasting experience and because i'm comfortable being on camera like mm -hmm. that is i mean i don't know if my bosses will admit that but i'm pretty sure that's why i got the job <laughs> Very we, always, true. we just always say like, um, cause basically it's all, the team is mostly developers and mm -hmm. my CS team. And every time I'm doing a video, we drop it in the team Slack and everyone's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's so cool. Yeah. But I would never be able to do that. <laughs> and I'm you like, know, that's why you guys hired me. <laughs> that's such a good point. So for people who are watching in case that you haven't started the channel or you're halfway through your podcast, where you're thinking, oh, is this thing even working? Um, I started podcasting eight years ago, YouTube since 2019. I got to say in the past few months, every single business lead, just like, you know, Eden said, they all came through, first of all, through my website. And but it's I know it's not because of my website. I know it says decent traffic, but I don't, you know, rank high for every single keyword and certainly not for Zoom necessarily, maybe just a few blog posts. But the idea of creating your own content inventory, a content library, it's so huge because all of them came in and said, yeah, I watch one of your videos on YouTube and that's how people find you. So I'm sure not all the videos are necessarily the ones I'm proud of or high production quality. That really doesn't matter. So uh, creating something. And I think like sometimes we ask ourselves to be pro, to be experts so soon, you know, like treating yourself as a new learner is very liberating, actually. Like Eden said, audio, video content, spontaneous live streaming stuff. Um, you know, you just present, present yourself. People can click, click away if they don't want to watch it, but the people who do find your content resonating, I mean, they're just, you're welcoming and, and, you know, infinite amount of opportunities from, you know, for me, for Eden sponsorships, new employment opportunities, consulting gigs, and they just keep popping up and you can choose from them. So it's really liberating. Yeah, totally. And I just want to add on a little point to that, that I thought of as you were talking about starting out creating content, how some of the videos that you create might not have been your proudest work, but mm -hmm. someone found it and found value in it. And <laughs> that's how they ended up hiring you. That yeah. it's also like, I, I think that there's so much value in like providing value for mm -hmm. one, but also like not getting stuck in a lane that you want to provide value for. So just using you, for example, Faye, like, mm -hmm. 
you know, you don't just do the Zoom stuff. It's like mm -hmm. you do the Zoom stuff and you have like your podcast and you do YouTube strategy. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly. I mean, all of it's kind seems aligned to us, but like you started out with one, right? Yeah. And then you yeah. started to branch out because you realized a lot of the techniques were probably applicable like across the field. Mm -hmm. And so that's like just another thing that I want people to think about, especially if they're just starting out is like, there's so much talk about like finding your niche, like, you know, yeah. cater, cater to your niche, but it's like you, the, your niche doesn't have to stay the same, first of all. So like right. whatever you start out thinking that you want to be your niche, maybe you start doing it and for a month and then you turns out you actually like, don't, you're not that into that niche. Like it's yeah. okay to pivot. It's okay to branch out and make mm -hmm. videos, make, create content around other topics. Like it's okay. I think people think that they have to get stay really focused in order mm -hmm. to be successful as a content creator. Mm -hmm. But I really think that it's really okay to do exploring and just trying different things until you find what you really love. For and sure. Like, I know that kind of sounds cliche, but yeah, it, it is about it is, like though. trying different things. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, absolutely. It, it's uh, as if back in our college days and especially, you know, I went to college right around, I graduated around 06. So back then and unfortunately still today as i'm surprised to find out is all these kids are you know sometimes like 15 16 years old 17 you have to decide your major and that's something you need to focus on you'll find a yeah. career following that major and it kind of doesn't make sense whether you're 17 27 or sometimes even 37 you're starting your first gig so i think everybody is different so Eden and i are different people for me i kind of like to get my hands in three to five things now some people really like two things like, oh, I don't want just the one thing, but I need about two things. And I got, you know, some people have family, they have their obligations, but everyone is slightly different. It's okay to pursue multiple tracks. And it's also very important to respect your own boundaries and just take care of your mental health, avoid burnout at the same time. I actually think focus on a few more things as opposed to, you know, putting all your eggs in this one basket totally. and, and waiting for it to be successful. That is so financially and, and mentally, uh, I don't know, very draining and very stressful. So, very limiting. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Um, Eden, you talk about sports a lot. I didn't even ask which sport did you actually do growing up or in school? All right. So uh, let me run through the list. I oh played ball, basketball, obviously, because I'm mm -hmm. obsessed with basketball. Basketball is my first love um, forever. I still go shoot around today oh, no. um well my pickup my, my, my pick days are behind me but i'll still i'll still go put up shots mm -hmm. um i figure skated and i know you played hockey oh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah so one of these days we'll have to meet on the rink and you know do some skate offs or something but <laughs> oh figure skating is hardcore i mean the, just the amount of bruising and practice that go into these competitions i don't think people are, can truly imagine it it's not just your job it's your parents job like whether you go pro or not, it just, wow, that's some serious dedication. Oh my God, totally. It was such a contention point when I told my parents I wanted to try out for the basketball team because they were like, you're already doing figure yeah. skating five days a week. Where are you going to fit basketball? And I was like, well, they have 7 a.m. practices open at the rink so I could do that before school, then do basketball after school. Yeah. <laughs> um, are yeah. you like seven feet tall? I know that's such a, that's a real cliche question, right? <laughs> no, I'm actually very, I'm tall for an Asian though, I will say. So I am like a tall five, six throughout my mm. basketball playing career. I thought I was five, eight, but it turns out I was just padding stats like they always do on rosters because I got measured at some point in college and they're like, now nah, you're like, you're very close to five, seven, but technically you're five, six. So. <laughs> All good. Where, uh, if you don't mind me asking, where were your parents from originally, which part? of china um well, so my dad's part of the family is from the guangzhou area of yeah. china my mom is taiwan native though so okay yeah so my parents actually um they met in taiwan that's where they got married and then they mm. came here in their mid tw mid to late 20s so mm. yeah so taiwanese american um although if you ask my dad i'm chinese american they like to get really technical with where my <laughs> roots roots are but i'm just like you guys are from taiwan so i'm gonna call myself taiwanese american i know our family's from the mainland also but like yeah you gotta pick one <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is uh, I think it's so interesting. I've been here. I wasn't born and raised here like Eden, but I've been here for 22 years and counting. And I noticed like I it's so funny. My my dad um, was Cantonese. He passed away 12 years ago. But Canton area, my mom is Mandarin so from the Beijing area. 
And uh, people don't realize that there are a lot of really big people in the northern part of China because a lot of people here, I, I'm I'm 5'4", and I've always been the smallest kid in my class since I know I'm not tiny. Yeah, I was like, that's I've not even small. that short. Yeah, First row, okay? Like since sixth grade all the way through 11, you know, 10th, 11th grade until I came here. And it was, there was a lot of contention there too, right? There's could be some bullying. I was like, just because it's so easy. Like right. <laughs> I was like the smallest kid. People don't realize that. And I, I only recently reflect that, <laughs> you know, kind of gave some feedback to my mom. It's like, you know, bullying is a really bad thing. It was actually very real because I was small. Like how come you and dad are small? And therefore like, She's like, oh my God, you're almost, <laughs> you know, like in your late thirties. And this is something that, that comes to mind. But I just want to say it, it is something a lot of people in the U.S. or outside of China don't realize that um, at all. So, um, wow, this is, this has been so fun. I mean, we've really taken it to like a corner of making this about like, I don't know, coffee shop uh, situation, but you live in New York now, Eden. I want to, yes. I want you to maybe highlight maybe your lifestyle. I know it's been challenging the past couple of years, but what are some of your hot spots in New York that you recommend people to check out if they do visit? And where do you, you know, work? Do you work in a co-working oh, space? What is it like? So I work from home. I always joke that I have to commute so far from one end of my apartment to the other because also living in New York, you know, the apartments aren't that big. <laughs> yeah. um, so I work from home. I actually do enjoy it. I think, um, I'm someone that's very comfortable in my working environment, um, mm -hmm. especially I like the familiarity. So I, I do, I think conceptually, I would like to go to like a WeWork every once in a while or post mm -hmm. up at a coffee shop. But um, I have a really nice office set up. I'm really blessed to be able to have a separate office from my bedroom because in New York, that is a bit of a luxury. Yeah. Um, but as far as it goes for places to visit. So I love food. Food mm -hmm. is like my love language. I just love food. And actually, I'm in the process of pitching a uh, mukbang. Have you heard of mukbang, the eating live streams? No. Oh, wait, wait a minute. You have to like drop in the link or something. Like, okay. how to spell I, that? M-U-K-B-A-N-G. So it's uh, mukbang is Korean. Muk is uh, to eat and bang is room. So mukbang is like eating room, technically. As how That's a restaurant? No, it's a live streaming genre where people eat massive amounts of food. They just live stream eating massive amounts of food. I'm, got, I'm aware of that. Yeah, uh, and it's, yeah, yeah. It's very popular in Asia because I read an article once and then like this, the psychology behind it and why it's popular in Asia and especially like Korea is because a lot of um, young people live alone. Like mm. there's a lot of singles in their 20s and 30s and into the 40s even. And so being able to sort of put on a, an eating live stream, like as you're eating your meals, it's like comforting. It's like makes you feel like you're not eating all your meals by yourself. Mm. Um, so I, I really like to sort of draw inspiration. From, so I'm really into like uh, Asian culture. I, I'm, I'm really sort of going through like a rediscovery of like my Asian roots in, in the last like sort of five years, if I'm being honest. Oh, um, I did too, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, real. I, I yeah. think it's kind of, crazy it was when you were talking about the bullying I I was sort of tangentially thinking about not bullying because of size but bullying because of being Asian in Arkansas mm -hmm. and I was just like you know I actually kind of went through that too in my in my 30s like just sort of processing mm -hmm. all of that because you don't really process it when when you're a kid you know you block it out it's like yeah you're just trying to survive yeah. out there and so yeah. like I I just I I really spent a lot of time in the last sort of five years doing a lot of reflection mm -hmm. about like basically kind of like having racial identity crisis growing up and just like yeah. sort of the coping mechanisms throughout mm -hmm. all of it and coming to a place now where I'm just like so proud of like I'm I'm like so proud and so happy to be Asian um but my yeah. whole point is that I draw a lot of inspiration from <laughs> Asian culture <laughs> right and I'm working on pitching this idea called lunch with camo where it's just gonna be me eating lunch people can drop in I'm probably gonna have you drop in hang out just like just like you said coffee talk just hanging out um 
love it you know we can we can eat food do some do some food asmr you know answer answer questions so that's sort of like the pitch that i'm working yeah. on right now <laughs> um, we, can use, we can use a restream too like go live on you know i'm i'm really not kidding again restream didn't pay me to do this but uh, i was gonna say that i'm not sure if you knew but restream can actually uh live stream on more than 30 platforms and a bunch of them are based in there's some, you know, a lot of Asian ones, for instance, but you know, where live streaming is has been popular for 10 plus years. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. So I think what I think it's interesting is about like Asian Americans living, uh, you know, here versus uh, the lifestyle over there. I think people can see a lot of parallels and uh, kind of there's there's that round where you're talking about like how to undiscover your roots and for you especially uh, moved around. Whereas for me, there's kind of there's a reverse cult cultural shock. Sometimes you go back and um, like one thing that that comes to mind is you know I I just love the the diversity that we get to experience in the U.S. Totally. I love the ability in New York uh, to walk down yes. one street and, and literally walk down a single street and discover 18 kinds of food and, and meet yes. people from 30 countries. By the way, before I forget, you have to go to uh, Lower East Side. So where Chinatown is. Love Lower East Side. Yeah, that's, that's oh my, my hood. That's, that's have my you spot. been to yeah. Ali Mama? I don't think I have. Oh, my God. Ali Mama, New York. I'm okay. sorry. I am writing that down right now. Oh, Ali Mama has the most incredible. It's basically oh rice, uh, rice donuts. So donuts made out of mochi. Yes. Oh, oh, and love I've, mochi donuts. And it's just like it's just I when I had and then all the bubble teas there, mochi donuts in in Ali Mama. Every time I go to New York, that is a must visit for me for us. And I've introduced so many friends to go there. Uh, it's just like wow, life is really good. I think oh, it's like. I just died and, and, you know, and this is so satisfying. Um, yeah. But I was, I was also going to say like in terms of diversity and all that, I just like something I, I love and, you know, talking about our origins, our skin colors to me, it is, it is something so rich about the culture here. It's something I really love. Um, then going back to Asia, I have to say like, you know, it, it's something that could be kind of a sensitive topic. You go to like, I remember when in my twenties, I would go to a meeting. It's like, I don't wear any foundations. I have nothing on right now. But you, you remember the days you have to figure out the foundation that actually matches your skin color. Will take you have to go to Sephora. You got to pay the money. You got to find the actual color, or else it won't work. But I remember um, going back to Shanghai, um, you know, a, a bunch a few years ago at least, and walking into any makeup shops, and and it's crazy because any color will will just work, right? Yeah. So for me, I, I never realized this. I remember, oh, I'm getting a, you know, anxious again, looking at the makeup products and and everything is kind of just designed for a specific skin tone. And I thought it was that was also kind of interesting, right? Like for me, that was kind of a cultural shock. Um, I wonder how you would feel like uh, visiting Asia. Have you been to like Beijing, Shanghai? So um, I've been to Taiwan a bunch of times. Like we would go to Taiwan every other summer growing up. The last time I've been was 20, December of 2017. So it has been a while. I will blame the pandemic a little bit for that. Yeah. But I totally, totally can relate to what you were saying. <laughs> it is, you know, like skincare products. Yeah. Just let oh, me say. It's like it's not even about color, yeah. Yeah, like using American skincare products basically my entire life, it just never felt like there was anything that worked for my skin type. Yeah. And, you know, now, like, I just remember going to Taiwan as an 18 year old. It was after senior year of college. And one of my older cousins was just mm -hmm. like, you know, we were just talking about girl stuff, makeup comes into play. And I'm like, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't really have that much luck with any of the products in America. And she's like, yeah, it's because you're in America. And yeah, no, ah. they did, like American brands don't understand your skin type. And mm -hmm. she kind of like walked me through her skincare regimen. And also like now e-commerce mm -hmm. is so much Asian things are much more accessible than they were mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So true. It's like, yes, style. Thank you. Thank you so much for basically my <laughs> yes, skincare style. routine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, style. I will be an affiliate for you guys. That is where I get all of my makeup products. Like, just like you said, I am mm -hmm. always worried about going into Sephora. Even if I can get the color to match at Sephora, I have had that yeah. foundation oxidized later and it just doesn't work out, whatever. I have very, very few fails with Asian skincare products and Asian makeup because it is just so much easier to find something that works for me. And that is like something I appreciate so much about being in New York is like not just the Lower East Side, yeah. Flushing, Flushing Queens. Yeah. All the signs wow. are in Chinese. I swear, yeah. every time I go out there, I'm just like, 
I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And there's that admitting there, there's like the separation from you and your culture and then meeting it again. There's something really to be said about, I think our, you know, sort of uh, our, our generation before, after, and it's just really interesting to see how kind of we all come together and, um, I'm not trying to be oh more powerful. I'm it's so funny. I'm still looking at oh I'm, why am I still displaying book <laughs> bag on this? Oh god, we've our conversations moved on uh, beyond that. But it's really interesting to talk to another Asian creator, um, Eden. That's why I was really look really look forward to this. As soon as we connected, the first minute I knew I wanted to do this and kind of amplify, celebrate each other's stories and and voices. But before we conclude, because I'm going to give you back to your your audience as well, is I want to mention the 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 hue lights, whatever that you don't have to uh, buy it from yes. Philip Hue. But please tell tell people who are watching right now uh, how you created this like amazing setup, you know, lighting setup. Yeah. So yeah. I actually have my boss Aiden Fitzpatrick largely to thank for sort of guiding me through my setup process. Mm -hmm. um, because we are a app that facilitates great video, it's really important for us to look good on video. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, when I showed up that first day, he was like, yeah, you're going to have to upgrade your setup. Like, <laughs> he was like, get you some. So I'm using these are the Hue Play Bars. Mm -hmm. um, I love them because you can change the color. I will play around with the color a little bit as I talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I just have two set up. This is a blank wall. Mm -hmm. The colors really give it like so much just like added dimension. It's really crazy. Like I never expected just lighting to make that much of a difference, mm. but it does. Like even just now switching from pink to green, like I feel like I have like a totally different vibe for like mm. just showing up to a call. Like, I don't know, this like sort of green, we can do, go like a green, purple, purplish. Yeah. Are like, they plugged into the wall or are they like pre-charged through USB so or something? These are plugged into the wall, but mm -hmm. I also have a one that that charges and it holds charge for about like two hours without yeah. being plugged in. Um, yeah. That sometimes I add as a third light. But yeah, right now I just have the two. Yo, Hue lights, a little bit of lighting can make so much difference. Mm -hmm. And it's I was telling Faye right before we got on the call, it's all about light positioning. Mm -hmm. My little cheat code is do not put that hue bar too close to the wall put mm -hmm. it about like a foot and a half two feet if you have the space to mm -hmm. really um let the color like splash onto the wall otherwise you have something that's a little more Ooh, like concentrated like a, and muted yeah. but like i had if i set it to about a foot away mm. it just like sort of gives the wall a wash of color i just love the dimension that it adds to like my scene yeah. Also, by the way, the question I didn't ask, which is they need to be elevated, right? To a degree, they, they need to sit on something because if they're yes. sitting on the floor and then, right. you know, the position might not work as well. Yeah. So I have this, it's just sitting on like my little, little cube yeah. right here. Yeah. And the other one is my little plant table. So it's just like a little coffee stand height table. Yeah. Like so they're up. different heights. That's interesting too. Yes. Different oh, heights. Yeah. yeah. So play, like play around a lot of playing around to find the perfect positioning. I um, actually did have the light on the floor at first and was like, yeah, this isn't gonna work and had to sort of like bring yeah. in different elements of my room and rearrange it so I would have something to sit it on. Mm. But also another big key for the lighting to show off is that you have to have really good blackout blinds because I have a huge window right here mm -hmm. and I have two towels sort of basically taped up over the window and I have two more Amazon boxes blocking out the light to be able to see this like lighting effect. Otherwise, it'd be totally washed out and you'd like barely even notice. Right. Like, look at me. What's going on is I, I got two, uh, one ring, two key lights here. They're pretty dim at this point. And I just have regular blinds turned down. But you can see how bright, not just on my face, but how bright behind me looks like. And when I have one of those, I have, I don't know what this is even called, but I have one of these uh, Govi lights. Yeah. And then if I just change it, you can you sort you can sort of see, but you can see the big difference between my background and Eden's background. I just want to say this because it takes a, a lot of experimentations to get the exact look you want, and you just can't get too frustrated. The good news is with Amazon, I guess the things that don't work out, you can kind of return them too. So, yeah, totally. Oh. I I totally swear by lighting and makeup tests. Like, yeah, 
I always do lighting tests, even though I have, I know that these are set up and they work. I still do a light test every single time just to make sure, like, I never know how much light is coming in through the window, if it's foggy, mm -hmm. if it's going to be raining or if it's going to be really bright. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, experiment, try different things until you find what works for you. That's it's, it's the fun. That's fun for me. I like that part. I like the rearranging, um, until I get my setup perfect sort of feel. Yeah, oh, I love it. This is so cool. And uh, thank you so much, Eden, for your time. And for for all of you guys who hopped on and off during the, the live stream session, watch any part of this uh, even after the live show, love comments. And I'm going to repurpose this for my, uh, for my uh, podcast channels as well. So Google Podcasts, Apple, Spotify. And for Spotify, I'm able to upload the video so people can actually watch or oh, listen awesome. to it. Yeah. yeah, that's a new feature, right? It's pretty new. Yeah, since October last year, that's okay. when they released it. And and unfortunately, it's not really on all the other platforms just yet. Right. Um, so it's basically you have to use Anchor as your hosting and then gotcha. um, use Spotify as the destination that actually can display uh, video. But it's so easy. The user experience is very streamlined, like literally one button push. You can switch between watch versus listen. And nice. with that said, I would love to have you, you know, come back. There's so much we can talk about, Eden. But um, oh, wow. Is that our timer? Is that, is that our time being up? Yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> That's my, no, there's no time up for us. It's like my next meeting. Today is a kind of a meeting heavy day for me. But gotcha. Yeah, I, I love this. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Eden, anything else? Any call to actions? Any. <laughs> <laughs> download camo yeah. right now i mostly just want to say if anyone mm. has any questions about camo please feel free to reach out and Faye, thank you so so much like honestly it like i am new to this industry and seeing other asian females in the industry like you like stephanie Liu, like gave gave me so much confidence because i had a lot of imposter syndrome when i was just starting out and like mm. i you know knew you were in the space because of our partnerships guy al Stephanie Liu, I met early on too. And it's like, I really am so grateful that you guys are in this space with me. And oh. it's like, I mean, I, I know it's such a corny phrase, but it's like, you guys are like really sort of paved the, the road that I'm walking oh. now. And like, I'm really, really grateful for that. Oh, amazing. Uh, let's please keep in touch. I'm so excited about, you know, what is to come and uh, love to share those moments. And I know that sometimes the, the pandemic, even before the pandemic, we sometimes creators can all feel alone you know we're home and i think there's a difference between being alone versus loneliness like totally. being lonely yeah so um i just i'm so grateful to be able to connect with people from around the world like yourself new york isn't so far yeah i was about to say next yeah. time you're in new york please hit me up oh, love to I get coffee love to. love to get bubble tea let's you know we'll, i mean yeah. i'm sure we can hang out for like a whole afternoon just like talking shop or not shop so <laughs> for sure for sure this is amazing and uh yeah please go check out ali mama today or tomorrow you just um oh yeah. i will <laughs> please do um so this is awesome i'm gonna take us offline now bye everyone bye life